We're looking at First Corinthians chapter thirteen. Amen. Glory to God. I want to put it here on your screen for you. Um, I'm going to start. I'm going to kind of walk the dog slow, but I'm going to start in the. I'm going to start at verse one as I share this word tonight. As I got all my little screens open, let me magnify this. All right. Okay. My words went blank. There go my words. Okay. So it's starting out like this first first corinthians chapter 13 verse 1 said if i speak in the tongues of human beings and of angels but i don't have love i am a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal if i have the gift of prophecy and i know all the mysteries and everything else and if i have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I do not have love. I am nothing. If I give away everything that I have and hand over my own body to feel good about what I've done, but I have don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Verse four starts like this. Love is patient. Okay. So I want to go backwards just for a minute tonight. And it starts with, if I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I do not have love, I am a clanging gong or clashing cymbal. So I want to start there on tonight. So I want to stop sharing my screen and I'll probably go back to sharing it a little later, but I want to just stop right there for a moment. Okay. So what's love got to do with it? is a whole lot. Love has a lot to do with everything because it is one of the things that we are supposed to be having. Uh, later down in the scripture, the Bible says that these three remain faith, hope, and love. Um, and these things are essential to our belief as believers. We need love. We need to have love. Um, because love is one of the most powerful forces. And why is it the one of the most powerful forces? If you go to John 3.16, and this is a memory verse for everyone, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So as I was at work and I was pondering this, the Lord was laying out to me. He he said that he took the portion of himself and he wrapped up in human flesh and called it his son. And then he asked his son to perform uh, what people would call a modern day uh, martyr call upon himself for our sake. So because the nature of things that were going on and I'll also bring up this point later is God was tired of having to have the priest go in and that always there was a dead carcass of something because people kept messing up mm, that's going to be good for later people kept messing up so Jesus says oh God says okay so I'm going to send my son down to the world. He's going to die for uh, mankind. And so Jesus already knew that his mission was going to be one of that, a martyr, because he was going to be killed for the sake of a cause, which is getting us connected back to God. Because why in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, we lost access to Eden. That's good. We lost access to Eden. So Eden was a place that was plentiful. There was lots of food and th there was lots of vegetation and fruit and things for Adam and Eve to live off of. And, and even in this place, then you have, you're in this lush, beautiful place. And then you have the enemy come in and the enemy says, hey, did God tell, did God tell you that you can eat uh, from the, this tree? And they go, well, no, God said... We can eat from this tree, but we can't eat from this tree. And so they said, oh, well, wait, well, what did he say? What happened if you did? And then he says, well, he says that if we did, we're going to die. 
And he said, well, well, you won't surely die. You'll just be like him, knowing good and evil. Now, let me state this here. What happens is we tell, so the enemy, he, here's what he did. He told a truth, but he did not reveal the rest of what would happen, further making it a lie. Because if you have a half truth, it's still a whole lie. Because you did not reveal the contents of what happened. So he told them they weren't surely they're going to die. So he didn't surely die that moment. But death came upon the earth. So now we have the curse of death upon the earth. So now people had to die. Now, even though God was allowing them to live to be 900, it said later on in the scripture that Jesus started to, the God started to shorten the time because he had, if he said, if he didn't shorten the time, then the world would go on forever. So he started shortening the span of man because, listen, Moses and them, they lived to almost be like 900 years old. And today, uh, today some, some don't make it past five. Some don't make it past 10. They don't make it past uh, 15 or 20. Whatever number you want to go up, some don't make it past that age. And so they lost the garden. And not only did they lose the garden, they fled communication and connection with God. And the thing that, and this is good for our everyday life, this principle, the thing about it is, is when they fell uh, out of connection with God, they left away from their place and they hid from God. And so God went back to the garden expecting to find uh, Adam and Eve there. He went back there expecting to find his children there and they were hiding. And he called to them. He said, where, where are you? And they said, well, we're hiding. He said, well, why are you hiding? He said, because we're naked. And he said, well, well who told you you was naked? And he said, well, did y'all eat from that tree? Because you didn't know you was naked at first. And now you know you're naked. And so that's where we get our knowledge from. Uh Knowledge is particularly not a bad thing, uh, but it's power to those who use it for good. Let me just say that because too much knowledge is a, a whole lot of it, it can be uh, damaging because, you know, what they say, I don't mind is the devil's workshop. That's, that's what the colloquialism we have uh, used in the world. Now, how does all this apply to love? We're going to get to that. So Adam and Eve loses. So they lose they lose the garden. And now. They had to be banished from the garden. And Jesus says, well, oh, God says, well, snake, you're going to crawl on your belly for the rest of your life. You ain't going to have legs no more. And thank God they don't. Amen. Glory to God. But I heard, I heard as a scientific fact, if you burn a snake, their legs will come out. This is what I heard. Now, this is, I haven't done it myself, but this is what they say. Amen. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to find a snake so I can prove that. However, so then Adam, uh, then God says, well, okay, Adam, you got to work all your life. And then this is where men come into, they were working and doing their things and then say, well, you have to have labor pains and your labor pains are going to be like this. And so now we have all these things coming upon the earth because of disobedience. And so we lost the garden. We lost the place of plenteousness. Uh, they lost that place. And so then, well, God said, uh, then later on we go and now we go to Cain and Abel. And in the story of Cain and Abel, we know that Cain was upset because God accepted Abraham's sacrifice and him being upset. He said, well, God, I gave you my, I gave you my crop, but God said, well, Cain, but it wasn't your, it wasn't the best. It wasn't, it wasn't your first. Abel gave his first and you just gave some. So God doesn't want some time he wants the start of our time. He wants the beginning of our time. Amen. Glory to God. You don't just want. Amen. Glory to God. And yes, we live busy lives, and the Lord knows that. Any, however, guess what? It's best to start the day honoring the Lord because when you put Him first, guess what? The day just goes smoother. I'm here to prove that. I'm here to tell you that the day just goes smoother when you honor the Lord first. Amen. Glory to God. And so, after Cain and Abel, then Cain decided, well. 
I'm mad at my brother and I'm jealous of my brother now that's gonna and, and so now I'm gonna kill him. And so he took him out of the field and he killed him and then there was blood shed. And then we had blood shed. And then after that, from that point, that's when God started asking for a blood sacrifice. After that point. Notice in the garden, if you read this in Genesis, God had not asked for a sacrifice of the shedding of blood until there was actual blood shed. That's key. That's key. It's key in scripture. So then he started asking for a sacrifice after that because there had to be bloodshed because guess what? Now we had a disobedience and now we got killing. Now we got bloodshed. His blood is crying out for the ground. Now I'm going to require a blood sacrifice because I need some kind of blood to come up before me to cover these sins now. So where things kind of uh, bridge the gap, there was a point in it and God said, I'm tired of y'all sacrifices. I'm tired of the incense. I'm tired of all of it because it's just aimless for y'all. You know, y'all keep messing up. So God is saying, said within himself, I have to fix this. So he took a portion of himself, wrapped up human flesh, called to his son, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ comes into the world and he lays down his life for mankind. God did this because he loved us. Now, how many of you out there would give your children over to evil men to be killed? Nope. There's none of you that would do that. Nope. nope. But God loved us so much that he ordered for his own son to be killed. We ought to think about that. I'm going to say that one more time. He loved us so much. And I was thinking about this on the way to work. He allowed. He put it. He allowed. He told his son, hey, you, I love you. Go, go die for these people. You have to die for these people now. The thing about it is God showed his love early on because it was in the story of Abraham and Isaac when Abraham was going to take Isaac up Mount Moriah. And kill his son, God stepped in and provided a ram in the bush. Why? Because there was a ram stuck in the thicket because he said, you're not going to have to sacrifice your son because the ram in the thicket is going to be the sacrifice. I have provided uh, myself a sacrifice so you don't have to kill your son because guess what? Later, my son is going to die for you. The funny thing about that is we see these contexts, we see these contexts in scripture again. This appears again when Lazarus died and Jesus went to raise him because he said, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come and raise you to show that I am the resurrection. Because guess what? I have to die first because I got to go take this thing out of death before you go die. Now, later, Lazarus died again, but that was after Jesus died. That was after Jesus led a uh, captivity captive. That was after the people that were in tombs got up and walked through the city when Jesus said it is finished. That was afterward. That's why the Bible describes Jesus as the first partaker of death. Now we're getting, we're getting some more context through this. So it was all because of love. And then after the church is birthed, Jesus sacrifices his life. And after the church was birthed, listen, we're going to talk more about that because this, this crucifixion is definitely connected with love. And we're going to see some things that we might have to take. Uh, so Paul, uh, he starts this and he says this in Corinthians. He says, if I speak in the tongues, of human being. Now, let me tell you what he's saying. He's saying that if I am able to talk plainly and I'm able to speak different languages so that I can not only talk to people, but I can minister to people, he said, and then if I use my heavenly language, which is, this is called the gift of, uh, he said, the tongue of angels. So, angels speak the same prayer language that we all speak. 
Now, this, that's why he, Paul is making, because why? He said it when we, when a person speaks in tongues, they are speaking to God. Their spirit is praying to God. It's a conversation to God. That's why he will say, well, there he's speaking in tongues, but he don't have no interpreter. Guess what? When it's a conversation between you and God, you don't need no interpreter. Now, if I'm standing up and I'm giving you a message and I look like I'm talking to you and I'm exclaiming and I'm speaking in tongues, then yes, I need an interpreter. But if I am in my private, you see me and I'm in my private moment with God with my eyes closed, guess what? I am not talking to you. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. So, um, uh, and then God will send an interpreter in that moment because guess what? God is clear and concise on his messages. We do not serve a dummy God that would put someone in a place that is speaking in tongues, giving a message to the body of where there is no interpreter. And so, because God does everything decent and in order, and we are here to be able to take back the integrity of our God. A lot of people, I know I'm going on a rant, but this must be said, a lot of people have put things on God that God has never said, he never sanctioned, he never said it was a part of his character, but yet here it is. Amen. Amen. Because the crazy thing about it is it's funny how we say, well, um, well, God, you know, he gets tired of people. But we read in Isaiah where it says that God does not faint nor get tired. So we've got to stop some of the colloquialisms that we say because the word of the scriptures all tell us that who can know the mind of God, who can judge it? I know it sounds cute. I know it sounds glitzy. I know it sounds it sounds nice, but we have got to stop it because it's not funny. It's no longer. It's not funny. We and it's crazy because people in in, in countless and numbers of pulpits and they stand up and say God is tired and God ain't no that God never asked you to be His spokesperson. Well, God ain't no punk. What does that even mean? And this is why Christianity has become a joke to people. Because we saying a whole lot of stuff but ain't saying a whole bunch of nothing. And we should be offended by those things. We should be offended by those things because we all say, no, that ain't, that's not scripture. That's not that's not right. Now, yes, we do know that the word of God says that God said that his spirit would not dwell with man forever. What that means is that the spirit, our spirit that we have, will not live in our bodies forever. And it means that, guess what? When he calls us home, that's the day that grace will be no more. But until then... There is grace for people who need grace. And I'm not saying use grace as a license to do whatever you want, but I'm saying for those that really need grace, there is grace. And I don't know about you, but I need grace. Amen. Because guess what? Nobody wakes up every day planning to error. And we have to understand that in our in our, our in our our, our 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 minds because we don't understand that we when we approach sinners we think that they are beyond God's reach. We say, "Oh, you a sinner? You a wine bibber? You this? Listen to me. There is grace for that. Not grace that they continue to do it, but God knows the nature of man. He knows what he put inside of man. And guess what? God has enough patience for man. And so now we know how God deals with us because guess what? Israel always ended up in exile. And to me, exile is like time out. So Israel always ended up in time out. We know that God is going to, he's going to reprimand us. He's going to discipline us because it said that those that he loves, he chastens. We know this. 
but God has never offed anyone. And we need to understand that in the church. Now you may be done with them, which still ain't scripture, but God has never offed them. So we cannot refer to people in a way as if God is done with them because we're done with them. I'm still talking about love. And so we come now, Paul saying, although I'm doing all of this, you see me working in church. You see me the laying on of hands. You see me giving to the poor. You see me paying my tithes and my offering. You see me taking care of my pastor. You see me doing all these things. You see me witnessing. You see me, uh, you see me doing all of these things. But if I don't have love, none of those things mean anything at all. He said, actually, he said, I am a clanging gong and a clashing symbol. He said, I'm nothing. If I don't have love, I'm nothing but a show. I'm nothing but noise. I'm a windbag. I'm full of it. And so he goes on to list all of those wonderful things that people do. He said, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. And this is why I said that love is the strongest force because how, you have to have a whole lot of love to want to kill your child on behalf of some other people. It takes a whole lot of love for that. And that's why love is the most important thing. And so, Paul, we jump down in Corinthians and he says, love is patient. Now, let's get into this patient thing. Here we go. We get there. Love is patient. What is patient? Well, the dictionary says that patient, listen to this, is the quality of being patient as the bearing of provocation, annoyance, misfortune, or pain without complaint, loss of temper, irritation, or the like, an ability or willingness to surpass restlessness, my God, or ignore it when confronted with delay. Patience means a lot. Let's dissect this word, patient. The quality of being patient as the bearing of provocation, annoyance, misfortune, or pain without, somebody say without, without complaint, loss of temper, <laughs> irritation, or the like. So patience means that we as people, and this is how we're supposed to be towards people, we are supposed to be patient when they have things like provocation, or uh, there are things of, it said, annoyances. How many times have you ever been annoyed by a person, a place, a person or a place, or, pe or a person or people in a place or people in a thing? The main root of all that is a person. Let's, 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 let's break it down to the bare minimum. And the thing that we we don't understand is we get annoyed so quick. I got to go here. We get annoyed. And I, I got to talk to us because we in church. We get annoyed, annoyed when people are late to church. We get annoyed when we feel like they're not doing their job. We get annoyed when we feel like that they're not listening, when the tithe ain't coming in right. We're all kind of things. We get annoyed. We get annoyed with our family members when we feel like that they, their isms and schisms are in the way or they're not using their money right or they're not in a right relationship or they're not treating their cars right or they don't clean their house or they talk crazy or they use a lot of profanity or they loose and they do all kind of things. 
You get annoyed at work when you feel like somebody get more time than you or more opportunities than you, or you feel like somebody talking about you, or you feel like it ain't about you, and all kind of things. Annoyed. We get annoyed when things are not right. Yes. Annoyance is natural. It's natural. However, any feeling that we have in the natural, we're supposed to check it in the spiritual. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, let me break that down. Uh, also, here we are. Um, it said being a uh, patient as the bearing of misfortune or pain without complaint, loss of temper, irritation, or the like. So, this means that as uh, when you get people in church, also. They like kind of have the can't help it. Like that's what my grandma would call it. She would call it the can't help it. Like um, maybe, I don't know. I can't judge. Maybe cigarettes are your vice and you can't stop smoking, but you're trying to stop smoking, but you can't seem to like kind of like combat it. And a lot of people say, oh, go cold turkey. You know, God is a miracle worker. And he is. He is. He is. God also moves in steps as well because the word of God tells us what that the steps of a good man are what ordered by the Lord let me tell you let me I want to point out something Mo, uh, Noah was found drunk in the cave after the flood come on this is a, this is a, we want to make it seem like that once you get saved, you become perfect. No, ma'am, no, sir. If we were perfect, why would there be a need for grace? If we were perfect, why would there be a need for mercy or needing to be pardoned? Mm -hmm. This is why that this is why there had to be Calvary because Jesus. Because God said, "Listen, I am so tired of these cow things coming before me. I need, I, I need something. There has to be grace and there has to be mercy because my people are not perfect. They're going to need to be pardoned. They're going to need to repent. They're going to need to say, I'm sorry to each other. So I have to provide some kind of advocate or leeway for the people to still come to me." He said the first time they lost communication in the garden, but they're not going to lose communication the second time. You all thank God for Calvary. You all thank God for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. He said we dropped the ball the first time, but we won't do it the second time. And it's not that, he, not that God dropped the ball, but the people dropped the ball. Mm hmm he said, I'm going to make sure they don't drop this ball this time because they ain't going to have no excuse talking about, well, God, we couldn't we couldn't connect with you because you was angry at us and you put us in time out and we couldn't talk to you <laughs> because you didn't want to hear from us and you said you hate us. We literally have no excuse now. Literally no excuse. So... As Paul is saying all the is saying all this, he he said the love is patient, and so that means that you know when you you we have to be patient, because guess what? I was having a conversation. It was so, it was so funny. I was having this conversation with this uh this preacher that I I I know he is a minister and he used to be a pastor of a church, uh and he was saying uh me and my friends were having my comrades were having a conversation conversation about why church churches aren't growing and why uh, people are choosing other religions or they're going holistic and I said you know I said I'm going to say this and I said it, it may not be popular with you but I'm going to say that the church is self imploding itself it is not God's church it's the people 
Because what it, well, the first thing that we do when someone comes in church and they smell like cigarette smoke, what's the first thing you what's the first thing you do? We're human. What's the first thing we do? We say, oh, they smell like cigarette smoke. Oh, they've been smoking. Start complaining. We do it. I've done it. I'm guilty. I'm like, oh, they just came, they just had a Marlboro. <clears throat> oh, Jesus. You know, we do that. We do that. All of us do that. Because that is the thing that we have inside of us called awareness. And I learned how precious this thing called awareness is because let me tell you something. When my biological father had a stroke, he had no awareness of what even happened. That's why the saints would say, I thank God that I'm in my right mind. Because look how something that small can take away your awareness of what has happened. But so God put this thing inside of us called awareness. So we're aware of things, you know. Oh, that hurts. Oh, that's hot. Oh, that's cold. That's awareness. We're aware of these things. And so we become aware of these things. But we have to be careful because guess what? The, what the enemy does with our awareness is he takes our awareness, then he propels it with judgment. And so it takes the humbleness inside of us, the humility inside of us to say, yeah, you know what they smell like? You know, they, they, may, they may have something with smoking, but guess what? God still, God has grace for them. If they freely accept that God has grace for them. Um, a person comes in and, you know, uh, that's kind of like in, a, in, in uh, when we were at Quality Inn and there was this woman and she had came to the hotel because she was geared to uh, have a rendezvous with somebody and she was married and she admitted that to us in church. She admitted that to us. She said, I came here in this hotel to do this. She said, but I heard the word of God that I was pricked in my heart and I, I changed my mind. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to uh, go through with this. And guess what? We didn't judge her. We didn't judge her. However, but I'm pretty sure some more people in the room probably did. I ain't going to act like they didn't because I guess what? I don't know people. I don't live in their mind. So we have to understand that the church will grow when we start to have a growth mindset. And it starts with the mindset of love. When Jesus caught the woman in, a, 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 in, the, in, the, in the midst of adultery and the, it was the church, it was the church that took her out in the street and threw her down and talked about, we got to stone her and kill her. It was the church that did it. Why? Because the Pharisees were there and the Sadducees were there. Who are the Pharisees and the Sadducees? They were priests and teachers of the law. What did they do? What did those church people do? They took the girl out in the street. They laid through her before Jesus. They didn't lay her. They threw her before Jesus and said, hey, our law says that if she's caught in the midst of adultery, she ought to be stoned. Jesus never mumbled a word. They went on to say stuff because Jesus was writing in sand. And he got up and he said, those of you that are without sin, cast the first stone. Nobody could cast a stone because all unrighteousness is sin, even down to the, the faintest of thought. Amen. But Jesus, in all of his humility, in all of his love, he bends down and he picks her up and he says, where are your accusers? And she said, they're not here. And you know what he said? Neither do I accuse you. Go away and sin no more. So Jesus could have taken them all. My God. Jesus could, I just felt something in my spirit. Jesus could have taken the moment to embarrass her, to say every, to, to expose everything that she had done, because guess what? He knew it all. 
but he did not take that moment to expose her. He chose to give her love instead. He didn't complain and say, you supposed to be following the law and you know the law. And so I don't know why you're not doing it. You just a sinner. You, he didn't take the moment to crush her spirit. But he took the moment to build her spirit. And she, and I believe that she believed. Now, how is that different? Because the woman that was at the well, what Jesus did is guess what? Jesus told her who, how many hills that she had, started telling her all about her life. Because remember, she said, hey, come see a man that done told me all about my life. Jesus started reading her all of her life. He could have did the same thing to the woman. That was caught in the act of adultery. Could have did the same thing, but he chose to cover her instead. Now, see the woman that was at the well. She was kind of cocky with. She was like, "Well, who you think you are?" Well, who? he he had to say, "Okay, well, listen, I I know this about you. Okay, this is this is who you are. Let me tell you who you are. I told you that I'm living water, but let me tell you who you are." And even in that. Even in that, after Jesus said, nah, you done have five husbands, and he, you done have four husbands, and the one you with now ain't yours. Did Jesus take the moment to call her a prostitute? Did he take the moment to call her anything outside of a child of God? No, he did not. Because guess what? They flipped the script, and they went to start talking about worship. But we as people, when we find out something about someone, we drive it home like a nail. And so patience means that we got to take something. And so uh, and, to, and to end that conversation with him so I can end my thought and go where I'm going, I said that, I said, and when we start extending love and compassion to those that are broken, then the church will grow again. We'll see growth. But right now, as long as we are in the state of condemnation, this is why the, the, the world is saying, to heck with it. I'm still talking about love being patient. And so, because I want to I wanna I wanna to point out something in scripture. And this is a true fact. Now, Jesus talked about parables in which if the person didn't do what they were supposed to do, that they will be cast into the lake of fire. However, Jesus never condemned anyone to hell. You cannot find that in scripture where he said, and you're going to hell. Amen. Amen. It's not in scripture. So why are we doing something that is not scriptural? You, I know back in the day they say, you know, you preach fire and brimstone and preach hell and preach that they're going to hell. Jesus never told anyone that. Where can you find that? Tell the people that they, they are just sinners and they're going to bust hell wide open. That's not in the word. It's not in there. I know this is challenging the way we think, but we need to stay true to what is scripture. But what did Jesus tell them? He told them, well, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So he told them, he said, I am the way. He said, I am the bread of life. There are many statements that he said that I am. And I'm not saying that, again, hear me, I'm not saying that hell isn't real. I never said that at all. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, Jesus never condemned anyone to hell. And I want to ask us, what's wrong with us? So Paul says love is patient. And that tells us that whether they be friends, whether they be family, whether they be church members, we have to be patient. I want to talk about a word that um, 
I want to talk about I'll talk about a word that we we don't really use um in scripture. We it's in scripture, but we don't really use it in church. Amen. Um now we do know that um there's a word that is very uh dear to my heart. And it's dear to my heart because it means so much. And when we find it in the model prayer, it says this. Uh, it said, well, we find this all in the Old Testament in Isaiah when he was saying he was wounded for our transgressions. Mm -hmm. Transgressions. And transgress. And it said that, that the way uh, uh, Paul later says in scripture that the way of a transgressor is hard. And I imagine that to be because guess what? If you're a transgressor and you know God, there's going to be some condemnation upon yourself. You're going to be like, now nah, I know that that wasn't right. You're going to have a conviction in your spirit. So you start thinking to yourself, well, I got to get right. I got to, I got to do this. I can't do that. I don't want to do that anymore. And guess what? Sometimes it put it puts yourself in a place. You're like, well, God, I, I really, I'm really messed up. And I really feel like this. And then God comes along with his grace and says, listen, my grace is sufficient, but you got to stay focused. And so God, that's in God showing his patience. It said that God's anger, but lasts for a moment. The funny thing that I find is that God's patience lasts but a moment, but our anger lasts forever. There are people that we done sworn, that we never talk to them again. I'll never let them get that close to me again. I'll never let them stay in my house again. I'll never give them this amount of money again. I'll never do this. We said so much that we're going to never do. Why? Because we are angry with the outcome and how it happened. And we have the right to be mad at that. However, I want to challenge you with this definition of patience as bearing annoyances, misfortunes, or pain without complaint. So we as people, that's not denying us our right to feel hurt or things like that, because guess what? God gave us emotions. Jesus had emotions. He was you know, he was playful with the children. He said, suffer not the little children to come to me. Amen. Glory to God. He was moved with compassion and he did things for people. Uh, he was moved with sadness when Lazarus died. He was moved with anger in the temple when they were selling things. So Jesus did have emotions. Amen. Glory to God. So we need to, as the church, be able to understand that emotions are real. This is why we have to have a comforter called the Holy Ghost to help us to manage our emotions because they are real. We got a lot of people in the church today that's going through mental issues and will not go see a professional. They will not go to therapy. They will not pray. They will not talk to their pastor. They will not get help. The word of God says it like this. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. The lack of knowledge. We've got all these things going. We've got all these things and we need to know the emotions are real. And so to bring it back home to love, we must be patient. And patient comes with some stuff. Because let me tell you something, as I, I share a bit of my story and my journey, what I'm going through, and I'm among family, uh, and I want to share this, uh, I've been blessed to have uh, a beautiful family that God has blessed me with. Amen. Glory to God. I've been blessed to have a, uh, a wonderful Godfather and a wonderful spiritual mom. And when I tell you that they were there when I needed them the most. But that God allowed me to meet them and uh, them for them to be there the most for me when there was a lack in my life. And I want to share a bit of that lack. I'm going to allow these people to keep their integrity because I don't believe in slandering anyone's character. However, there was a moment where uh, my natural parents were caught up with life and life's issues and quandarings and things. 
However, when my mother fell sick with COVID and was laying in the floor, the things that I had against her went out the window. And they went out the window because I'm watching what seems to be a passed out, my passed out mother on the floor. And life started to flash before my eyes. I said, my God. That could have been a moment between life or death. Then now we have at this moment, uh, my my natural father, and I, I, I want to talk about that because I I I can talk I can talk about it because guess what that's how we get free. It said that we're it says that we are supposed to uh share our burdens with one another. So when I when I was growing up, um, there was some contention in my home, and so uh. uh my natural father decided that he wanted to go do his thing. And um, for a person uh, like me, who was in school at the time, and I was getting into uh, singing because y'all know I am a music person. Amen, glory to God. That is my gift that God has given me, and I thank him for it every day. I was getting into singing. I was getting into acting. I was getting into a lot of different things at my school. I was making honor roll. Uh, I was making... Uh, life skills awards and they were having things like donuts for dads but there was no dad there for Michael um, they would have things like muffins for mom and there was no mom there for Michael because mom had to work a job because mom was a single parent or mom had something to do there was none of that there and so I found myself having to give that which I have not received. That's a hard pill to swallow, saints. That's a hard <laughs> drink to drink. That will put some hair on your chest, if not a gray hair. Because it makes you push yourself Beyond the limitations of hurt, my God, here, here I want to preach right here. This is what makes you push yourself beyond the limitations of which you have something against people, my God. It makes you tap into the love of God because you say to God, God, I need to get over this one. God, I need to get past this situation. God, I need to forgive this thing. If I don't, I'm not going to make it. Amen. Amen. And guess what? You don't always want to. Because you know why? Sometimes we wise in our own eyes. Even when the scripture tells us to be not wise in thine own eyes. That's my that that was my testimony. Because I dealt with the abandonment. And the funny the thing about it now is now I'm having to be here for my natural father in a way that wasn't done for me. But that's not far-fetched. You know why that's not far-fetched? Because it's not far-fetched because uh, there are a few months even before this happened and he had his stroke. I decided to forgive him. And I decided to forgive him because I started to understand his struggle. I started to understand that he was fighting something. I started to understand that he was dealing with a he was dealing with a a loneliness in his heart that could not be solved. And the only medication for it was drugs. He was dealing with something. I, and I had to think about it. I said, wait a minute. I've been lonely before. I know how it's made me feel. So how I, and I can imagine that torment 24-7. And so I was asking God to do some things for me. I said, God, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. I want to move to the next level. And he said, I cannot. He said, I'm willing to do that for you. But I cannot do that for you until you forgive your father. So literally God told me, no. He said, I will do it. But you have to forgive your father first. 
I was like, what? I ain't, I ain't feeling that. I ain't really feeling that, right? Because he don't know what he did. He don't know. He don't, I said, but if I had stopped, I said, God, yeah, God knows how we feel. He knows. He knows. He does. But I had to, and I know I'm going over. I'm watching my time. Y'all trust me. I'm watching the time here. I'm watching. I see it. I see it says 830. It's probably 831 now. I see that. But let me let me share this and then I will close for the night. Um, and so I I had to forgive. And then thank God that I did, because when this happened, to to live without regret. I was able to say, okay, God, well, I didn't have anything against him. Thank God for if you called him home, that was on you. And so that's how God is with us. We don't spend enough time with him. We turn our backs. We uh, we walk away. We say what we're going to say. We judge people. We do whatever we do, whatever we big and bad enough to do. But guess what? He forgives us. We give him this amount of time. He gives us all the time in the world. We don't listen to anything he say, but he'll give us this amount of time to complain. Because that's why that's when he said today, that's why David was able to write and say, I love the Lord. Because he heard my cry. He what? He pitied every groan. That's a complaint. God is patient. You know how I know God is patient? And as I as I close, because I'm looking at you. That's how I know God is patient. Because he renews his contract of mercy and grace over us every day. Hear the word and what it says is that it's because of his mercy that we are not consumed. And those mercies are new every morning. That's patient. As a guy I say, I'm excused this that you did yesterday. I'm gonna excuse the cuss word that you said. I'm gonna excuse the gossip you gossip, and I'm gonna give you a restart. That's patient. You don't get that from your job. Your job will put you on a probationary period if you mess up and they will dare you to mess up or they'll fire you. Love is patient. How patient are you? Now I say we're gonna walk the dog slow. We're gonna finish the rest of this the rest of this next week on this patient. The rest of this the next time we have it, we're gonna move on to the other characteristics, but just starting with patience. We need to be more patient. And guess what? If you're like me, you're thinking now about the people that you need to forgive in your mind. That you need to call and forgive. <laughs> if you're like me. There are some people that's over on the other side that you're going to have to say, God, will you tell them I forgive them because I don't want anything in the way. This is true. It's true. Um, I'm finished. And I went over time. I kept it a little long. But I, it, good start because this is vital and it's, it's needed. Amen. So, Amen. Uh, Papa, do you have anything? No, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk. Patient. And yeah, you're right about one thing, praise the Lord, in your teaching. There's somebody on the other side. I've got to ask God to, <laughs> to tell them I forgive them and hope they forgive me. Because <laughs> uh, I didn't do it while they were alive. We all have that. We all have that. I didn't do it while they were alive. And God is patient. He's patient. It, it, it makes me emotional because... I know how imperfect I am, but yet God wakes us up every morning. Man, that's that's deep. That's that's a, that's a heavy. That's yeah. heavy. Praise God. Mother Duran, do you have any any comments or anything? She's on speaker. She's on. You're on speaker. You're uh. No, you're she's on mute. On mute. You got to unmute. 
Here we go. Yeah. No, I've enjoyed it. You really have. Enjoyed the message. Yeah. It's like Sunday morning. Yeah. <laughs> Helps it helps us the hump day gets us through the rest of the week. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Love love it. Lady Davis, anything from you? No, just in, just enjoyed it. And love is is patience. The it, end the yeah. end the night. Everyone everyone needs to be patient with everyone. Amen. Amen.